Welcome to Fire University. This is a podcast dedicated to fire ecology and management within the Natural Resource University podcast network. My name is Dr. Marcus Lashley. I'm a wildlife biologist, an assistant professor of disturbance ecology at the University of Florida, and a lifelong hunter that's passionate about wildlife conservation and management. In this podcast, I will interview scientists and professionals, not only on the latest research in fire ecology, but also about their experiences in hopes that you as the listeners can learn why fire ecology is important and also how you can use it to meet your natural resource management goals. So let's get to the burning questions in Fire University. Hey everybody, welcome back to Fire University. Today, I'm pretty excited about this topic because I don't get to talk about it that much, but I think it's one that that uh, will be popular with our audience. We have Dr. James Martin and Dr. Mark McConnell here who are both experts at working with fire on the landscape to promote habitat and, and just quail in general, right? Quail habitat and, and quail in general. So thanks guys for joining us on the show. Really glad to have you and excited about some of the things that we're going to talk about. Glad to be here. Appreciate it. Yeah. So uh, I don't want to beat around the bush too much. If uh, people are interested in, in knowing more about you, we've we've linked some stuff in the bio to both of you. But specifically, I know uh, working with quail and being experts in, in quail research, you, you're very knowledgeable about fire and how we use fire to manage that bird since it is inextricably linked to fire. We call it the fire bird even uh, to go that far. So uh, one of the issues, I guess, that, that comes up pretty frequently, and we just had it recently on another uh, podcast episode when we were talking about turkeys, but the thing that keeps coming back uh, and I think it's particularly relevant in this conversation with quail is related to the spatial scale of fire. So I was curious, uh, either of you that want to jump in to begin with, what what spatial scale are, are we thinking about with quail just right out of the gate? You know, what size patches, I guess, are we targeting in general for quail? Yeah, I guess I'll take a stab at it first. I guess it's important to think about what we mean by scale. Uh, you know, scale is made up of two parts, the the grain and then the extent. And the grain in the context of fire would be individual burn size. And then the extent would be kind of this whole area that you're managing. You know, if you're managing a thousand acre property, maybe you're burning 50 acre patches or grains across a thousand acres in different times and seasons. But um so all, those two things work together if you're managing a property that say 500 acres you might want to burn say 50 acre patches across that 500 acres that that 500 acres being your, your extent that's that part of the scale i guess in, in addition to that there's this operational side of it as well i mean operationally you're constrained by what you can get done within a burn season depending on what agency you work for um so that has to be part of the equation as well. But I mean, biologically, we want to burn as small as possible for quail. And if if you could, for the species, you'd burn square meters at a time, right? You'd you'd want that mixture, that heterogeneity, at that fine a scale because we're dealing with a bird that doesn't move very far. They only weigh 160 grams or whatnot, um, and you you would burn at that scale. You would burn a quilt pattern across the landscape at, at a square meter but everybody knows you're not going to do that that's not operational so the real successful properties burn anywhere from five to 20 acres 20 acres even getting on the bigger side i think once you get started getting above 50 acres that's when it's probably getting to the point that it's not optimal for quail uh and then and when you say you know when you say not optimal quail, are you you're not necessarily saying detrimental. You're, you're just saying that it's, you, you may not be helping as much as you would by burning three blocks that equal 50 acres total. Yeah, I, I think there's diminishing returns on the value you get back from that. Okay. Again, it's that combination of grain and extent. If you are managing a thousand acres and that's all the quail habitat you have and you're burning all of that every year, 
I think that is detrimental. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're not going to have a, a very dense quail population burning at that grain and extent repeatedly. And we've, we we have a study area in, in North Florida that has that problem where they're burning too, too large a scale and too frequent. And the quail population is, is very low, about a bird per 10 acre. So it doesn't really support hunting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree. I, I generally tell people I work with, you can't burn too small, but then knowing that they're not going to be able to burn at very small scales. I think I remember one of the plantations in the Red Hills when I was doing my dissertation was, was showing me some five acre blocks they, they did. And I was like, man, that's amazing. And they're like, well, it's exhausting, but mm -hmm. it's amazing. And, you know, exhausting kind of just goes hand in hand with quail management. Uh, you got to have uh, some tough skin and a lot of grit. So the, the, I agree, the, the, the smaller, the better. But the thing when it goes to scale that I've, I've found helps a lot of landowners kind of visualize how big is too big is because we focus so much on actually getting the burn done and we don't talk as much about what that burned area looks like and how, how it's used after the burn. Um, now, we've all seen quail re go into stands again and eat dead grasshoppers and, and take advantage of that. But there's really no cover, depending on when you burn, for a, some amount of time. And when you black out, like in James's example, a thousand, if you've got a thousand acre place you're managing and you block off, you know, two, three hundred acres at a time, the quail cannot hang out in there all day. They may go in and out and, and, and get some free food, but they've got to go into these other areas that are unburned. And you've got some concentrated, concentrated bird numbers there that, that can have some can have some detriments to, from a mortality standpoint, depending on the timing. Um, and then the operational side, just to add to what James mentioned with landowners, I usually start them off small and give them a little five acre spot and get them comfortable with it. Cause it's not just the operational side. A lot of landowners are scared to burn 200 acres at a time because they can't see it all. And it's, it's hard for them to visualize managing a 200 acre fire. Now, if you've burned a lot, Managing a 200 acre fire is not a whole lot different than managing a 50 acre fire, but if you've never burned a lot, it's kind of hard to to reconcile that those that disparity. Uh, but yeah, the smaller the better. Um, the more smaller units you add, the more fire lanes you're adding, and that can right. that can be time consuming. Yeah, that that's an interesting perspective, and you know, someone who works with fire a lot with other species and a lot of ant landowners that are interested in using fire for instance, but have never used it. That's something that I tend to go to is try to scale them down. In fact, I did one experiment where we went all the way down to a 30 meter radius and a lot of people were burning now. Apparently uh, they emailed me and, you know, they're doing the bow range burning thing. And it, it was apparent that scale was a, a barrier that, you know, for inexperienced landowners, that, that might be a way that you can start using fire safely to get yourself comfortable with it to where you can then scale up to some reasonable scale to, to manage habitat. But it's interesting talking to you guys about this with quail. I mean, you, you essentially don't have quail in most landscapes without fire, uh, which we can talk about. Uh, we can unpack that more if you guys want to, but uh, you know, a lot of the, the private landowners that have quail are already well versed in the use of fire on their property. So, we might, especially with this species, it sounds like it's more sensitive on, you know, not that very, not that much of a burn block, really, right? That 50 acres or more, you know, 50, 100 acres is not that that big in the grand scheme of things on the landscape. So uh, it's kind of interesting to hear that perspective from you guys that, you know, we we might commonly run into that issue of, of too big, even on private landowners. Yeah, one way to think about it is if, if you have a thousand acre management unit and you just randomly put 20 points out there and you draw a five acre or 10 acre circle around each one of those, you want half of that area to be burned, half unburned. And, you know, if you have really big burn blocks, a lot of those random points are going to fall in areas that are completely black. Mm -hmm. And those are areas that are not going to be suitable for quail at certain times and, and they need both burned and unburned to carry out their life history. So it, you know, it's not just necessarily size of the burn is how well it fits into quote a theoretical home range. Um, 
I have a landowner in Central Florida uh, that is pretty clever. One way that he gets around having larger berm blocks is the shape of them. He makes them irregular shaped so that, you know, any given point, like I said, if you put it on the map and you draw a circle around it, it's going to have burn and unburn in it. But the actual burn block itself is actually a lot of acres. Mm. So, so, so he can cover a lot of ground that way. It's, it's actually pretty clever the way he does it. Yeah, that's yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, I've got a, a landowner in North Mississippi, re, new landowner, new to quail management, fire, fire, not something he was terribly comfortable with. And he gets um, the Mississippi Forestry Commission to do most of his burning. And they've got an impossible task with the amount of acres they're requested to burn, how many, the small window of burnt, especially this year when it was so wet. I don't know about y'all spring, but this was a, there were about three days in February we could light a fire. It, it, it was challenging and they've got acreage quotas. So they're lighting big fires. And in some situations, some of that ground was very close to not being usable at all to quail. And I was pretty okay with them burning really big blocks. Cause I knew over the long-term horizon of quail potential on that property, it was really necessary just to get a bunch of acreage burned. And my deal with him was once he got the whole place burned in a couple of years, we'd start chopping up smaller blocks, but he kind of had to get a big burn on it first um, and, and, and he'll tell me the story where before he bought it several, 20 years ago, it's a 2,600 acre plantation. 20, he said 20 years ago, they used to burn the whole thing in two days and just let it roll. And, you know, I, I don't want him to do that, <laughs> but. <laughs> well, I think that uh, brings up a good point yeah. about context is different now than it was 20, 30 years ago is you could probably get away with larger burn blocks years ago because, you were burning an area that was around, surrounded by a sea of other good habitat for quail. So, mm-hmm. we, yeah, in, you know, in a matrix of habitat. That's exactly what I told him. I said back yeah. then, your other neighbors were doing some other stuff too, so they had a place to go. Uh, right. That's not the case. That's absolutely right. Yeah, the land yeah. is zooming out. Yeah, and the predator context has changed too. I mean, the one reason why we're talking about burning huge blocks is bad for quail is because you're exposing them to hawk predation predominantly. And, you know, most people burn during March, April when we have a lot of hawks moving through because of the migration. And if you're exposing these birds to these large areas of black dirt, you know, 30, 50 years ago, that wasn't that big of a deal because the hawk population was much less than it is now. So because the predator context has changed, what might have worked 30 years ago is different than it is now. So again, like we were talking about before, the podcast started is the principle of managing cover so that you can optimize or maximize survival is the same but the prescriptions that we may apply on particular tracts of land is different than it was 20 30 years ago yeah that yeah those those are really interesting points and I, there are a couple of things that y'all have said that I, I want to unpack further one when we're talking about the the different levels of scale as you articulated earlier uh so how how much property does someone need assuming that they're surrounded by a a sea or a matrix that's unusable for quail how how much are we talking about needs to be in burned area before we can support a population of quail that's the 10 million dollar quail question uh we we'd love to know that one Uh, if i had a nickel (laughs) (laughs) uh so to answer your question, the best, the best science we have, and it's mainly from simulations, we think you need 1,500 acres, thereabouts, as a minimum size. If you're just managing that island, if you're assuming out past your 1,500 acres is nothing for quail at all, we assume 1,500 acres, thereabouts. Of course, if you're surrounded by other good quail habitat, you can get away with 50 acres. I have a landowner in North Florida that's adjacent to other property and he has 50 to 80 acres i think it is and he finds four or five coveys an hour uh, on those very small track because quail don't read property boundaries uh and you know he's basically part of a functionally 200,000 acre population uh but to answer your question we assume 1500 acres and then of that 1500 acres you want to burn about 50 to 60 percent of it a year every other year um for quail. Okay. As 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 interspersed as possible. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Where where you always have 
you know, if you drew a circle, like you said, a 50, was it a 50 yard circle? You want about half of it to be black and half of it not in a given year. Yeah. If you uh, just take five acre circles and put them around. And like I said, you want about oh five half acre. of that burn. Yeah. About five acres. I mean, that's ideal. Again, operationally, it may, you know, it might have to increase that. Right. But, um, when you, you yeah, know. it'd be really difficult to accomplish that uniformly across the landscape. That's and that's right. probably not what you're trying to do anyway. Right. Yeah, and right. how that, how that, uh, how your quail, like in an ag landscape, which I work a lot in, how that, for lack of a better word, quail cover is distributed, really jacks up the operational complexity of trying to create this situation James just described, where if you draw a bunch of, you know, five acre circles, because some of your quail habitat that you that needs to be burned is narrow it's it's patchy it's here and there we don't have just a ton of big blocks of really good quail cover in the ag landscape yeah a lot of so, build borders or, or uh, some sort of farm bill practice yeah, or something like that manipulating some of those some of those areas via prescribed fire can it, it, it creates some challenges but it's also you know it's kind of fun to figure out how to do it <laughs> and then of course but there's a certain threshold of complexity before a land or landowner just goes i'm out and, um, and I've also run in cause I tell them, you know, try to burn 50 per 60% of it in, in, in any landscape. I mean, I try to, I try to hit that sometimes. And I found that on big properties, unless they, m- most land, land management in the deep South that I've worked on, they're understaffed. You know, very few people have enough people to actually get all the work done, especially for, for quail management. Uh, but so, you know, hitting that 50% mark is pretty tough. We usually get closer to 30, um, and that that's a little easier for most people I work with to to accomplish. But uh, you know, it it like I said, there's just so much when it gets more complex, it just takes more time. Yeah, that point I was going to throw out there, and make sure our listeners understand today is, is you know we're talking about a lot of science and the complexities. And there was a good article years ago, I think it was I forget the exact title, but it was something to the effect of rednecks burn the woods. And at the end of the day, if you have questions or doubts or you're you know. Assuming it's a safe burn, go ahead and burn it. You know, it's like don't let the enemy of doing something good be the idea of having a perfect scenario. I mean, you're going to do more good in the long run by burning than than you're going to do harm, again, assuming it's safe. So within in doubt, I would just say light a match. Um, Yeah, that's what I always say. And that should be a a bumper sticker right there. (laughs) When in doubt, light a match. Just yeah, when in doubt. I'm sure we'd get sued, you know, for put a big uh, or <laughs> put a big yeah. red line over smoke, well, right? Yeah. yeah, I think arson immediately goes into the realm of unsafe. So yeah, that's right. That's right. <laughs> so when, that's the problem. When we're now getting a really long bumper sticker here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. How much do we need to write on that bumper sticker? It's going right. to be some small print. <laughs> yeah, that's I mean, right. All, all the way across the bumper. Yeah, yeah. that's right. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a great point and you know you what you're saying that that is pretty complex and even I, i've misspoke a few times trying to repeat what y'all are saying and i'm i work on fire a lot but it, it is a complex thing but what is very simple with quail is if you don't have fire you don't have quail in 95 percent of the cases i mean there's cases where we've substituted other mechanic you know with mechanical disturbances for fire um disking or roller chopping or something like that and you can pull that off it's not cheap Mm -hmm. um but uh in most cases fire is going to be required so when you were talking about having the 1500 acres to sustain quail were you talking about just to have quail or to have a huntable population of quail or just to sustain them so that, you know, basically they don't go in- extinct. Okay. Um, so you're, yeah, you're, you're providing enough that they don't just blip out because of some right. random of, event. Like the hawk, the hawk got lucky and caught five today. Yeah, that's okay. right. Or, you know, like we had this year and it was snowfall on some of our sites, you know, we, we lost, you know, we were down 14% of the birds survived the winter so far. Yeah. You know, that's um, not very good. Not good. We call those black swan events, and and we're operating on the assumption that fifteen hundred acres. If you have about a bird per two acres, you're going to have around eight hundred quail, and that's going to buffer you from those mm-hmm. extreme events. I, I see. Okay, that makes sense. And, and a lot of and a lot of properties, acreage wise, ownership, you know, maybe bigger than that, but it's not all quail habitat, right. you know, and that's right. And it's, 
like I said, I, I work on a property that's 6,000 acres. The overwhelming majority of it is not quail habitat, and that's that that's challenging. Yeah. 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 yeah and I, and I, I want to be clear to the listeners as well. You, the landowner doesn't have to own all that themselves. Yeah, <laughs> that's right. Yeah. You know, it's just that's how much acres of habitat needs to be within some defined area, right? We need about 1,500 acres of habitat, we think, in about a 10,000 acre landscape. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, you know, I'm not going to own it all because I'm a university professor and can't <laughs> afford 1,500 acres. Uh, but 10 landowners can own enough. 20 landowners can own, own enough. And if each one of them are managing 5, 10, 30 acres, mm-hmm. then we all can have enough. And you're going to have a cover year or two that's moving around the landscape. And you're going to see them every once in a while, but you're not going to see them every day because they're moving a, a mm-hmm. lot. Yeah. One of the biggest things I tell when I do extension talks was go find your property on Google Earth and start zooming out and identify how many landowners you know as your neighbors and how many of them have what you're looking for, whether it be quail habitat, deer habitat, turkeys, whatever. And what you'll find is every time you scroll that mouse back, it, it gets, it gets harder and harder to find somebody who, with a shared vision. However, they're out there. And oftentimes it just takes a little bit of talking to your neighbor mm-hmm. and figuring out, Hey, what, you know, cause like, for example, we've got a, a lot of landowners that, you know, well, yeah, I saw a quail for the first time. Well, great is that enough to make you do something about mm-hmm. it? Right. And, and sometimes you're right. It's just a little simple fact that, Hey, burning that pine forest, they've been meaning to burn for several years. They just never got around to it. And, mm-hmm. um, you'd be amazed quail, you know, uh, yeah, their populations have, have suffered some tremendous losses, but in James, uh, you can comment on this too, pretty damn resilient in, in certain landscapes when you start doing a little work. You know, uh, yeah, it's quite amazing where they can show where up. Where they show up. Yeah, yeah, just mind-boggling. There have been a yeah. few times where I, I have gotten on the map, like you just said, and scrolled out and looked at the county, you know, up at the county level. And it was like, man, where did a quail come from in this landscape? You know, because they Absolutely. showed up when we started doing some stuff, scratching the ground and setting stuff on fire. Yeah, they smelled the smoke, man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think we, they do. We, we joke about it, but they... <laughs> It is a it is amazing for a bunch of wildlife species that they show up when there's smoke on the horizon. So, uh, yeah, th- those are really cool things to to think about. I wanted to circle back around when we were talking about the role of fire and whether or not you could get away with other things, like I think you said roller chopping or disking. In in the when you have used those in in the stead of fire can you i I realize that you said that you could potentially sustain populations of quail can you have them at the same levels that you have them when when you're using fire primarily i don't think so Uh, i think those situations where we have quail where there's not fire is because there's frequent timber harvest that's setting back succession and and all the the um, silviculture practices that go along with that, you know, the, the, the ripping and bedding and site prep that's creating that soil disturbance. And then their herbicide is keeping woody encroachment from hardwoods happening. That's allowing quail to persist on those landscapes at a low density. And maybe mm-hmm. that's all you need. I mean, if that's the objective to just to have quail, that's, that's perfectly great. Um, but to have enough to hunt where you want to shoot 15 to 20% of those birds a year, I don't think there's any way you can pull that off without fire, um, in my opinion. No, I would agree with that. There are certain situations and where a disc is, is the more appropriate tool to, to change the plant community a certain way in a certain amount of time. But that's a, that's a, that's in addition mm-hmm. to a landscape with fire. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for a huntable population, I'm trying to think of an example. I don't know if there is one, well, James. The- I mean, like where I grew up in Piedmont, North Carolina, people didn't burn in the 60s. It wasn't a thing. It wasn't part of their culture, but there were tons of quail and people hunted them. Everybody had an English setter. Uh, And, but in the disturbance at that point was agriculture and disking and moving around fallow fields, you know, for tobacco crops. Mm -hmm. Um, So the, you know, the farming practices then created that plant community for quail without fire. 
but those days are long gone, you know. Um, yeah, we, we used to have the weedy fields because we didn't have all the herbicide applications to keep them clean now, right? The, the herbicides and you were plowing with a mule. Yeah, uh, yeah there, there's also you know, that. <laughs> yeah, you know, my, my, my grandfather tells a story about they got a, a cub tractor in the 50s, the first one they ever got. Uh, and they were all excited about it because they were like, well, we don't have to follow behind a mule. But his his father, my great grandfather, didn't let him use it in the field because he, he said it packed the land. So they still had they had the tractor sat in a shed, <laughs> and, and they still had the mules they were still using in the field. Um, they didn't really get a tractor they used in the fields until the late sixties, early seventies. Uh, so you know now you've got tractors that are, you know, eight wheels and articulating and uh, all kinds of technology to help. GPS driven, GPS driven, uh, artificial intelligence to spray weeds. Uh, so that that ship has sailed. We're, we're not going to have uh, weedy crops anymore. Mm-hmm. I don't think uh, at any scale it's going to matter for quail. So uh, we've got to manage the the non crop land uh, in general. Mm-hmm. There's exceptions to that, but we've got to manage the non crop land with with fire and, and, and other tools. Yeah, the current landscape for quail dictates. Pretty much, if you want a huntable density of quail, fire's got to be in your prescription. Yeah, cool. So we talked a lot about making sure that you have fire in the landscape, but what about, I mean, are there areas within your 1,500-acre block that, you know, you have frequent fire happening? It sounded like on a two-year re- return interval is, a, is optimal. Are there areas in within that landscape still that that don't get treated with fire or don't need to be? from the perspective of quail? Not really. We say two-year fire return interval as a general rule of thumb, and that, that rule applies, I think, to most areas, especially east of the Mississippi River. There's obviously exceptions to that. I know, Marcus, you've worked on areas in like Fort uh, Bragg that you know, a little bit more Zarek, mm-hmm. sandy site, that a three-year fire return interval is probably better. But in general, again, as a rule of thumb, two years is is the best but yeah i mean there's probably no nothing you're going to set aside that you're going to keep fire excluded from in that landscape i mean even if you have hardwood inclusion stand you know stands or whatever i mean for quail you would open that up and manage it mm-hmm. like oak savanna anyway so there's really no reason to keep fire out of any so of if it. it will uh, burn let it burn some of your if it will burn let it burn yeah. absolutely cool uh yeah that Another thing, I, you, when you brought up the the thing with Fort Bragg, where I did a lot of my my graduate research and postdoc research, it, I think you, that is a good point. That some of these things are dictated by the site and what the productivity is, and and uh, how fast succession is happening. That, those sorts of things. But another thing that I was curious to get you all's perspective on: you're saying a two year return interval. But that doesn't necessarily, that's just an average, right? I mean, does that necessarily mean you want every piece of ground burned every two years? Or is it okay to have some ground that you're burning every year and some maybe that's a little bit longer interval? What What is ideal in that situation for quail? I'll let Mark take this one. I'd say the two years is what I tell people to aim for because I know some years they're not going to get to every acre because of weather or constraints. But I typically want them to burn. I want to, I want to see every piece of ground is disturbed every other year with very few exceptions. I'm, I'm trying to think like, even like, you know, things like shrub cover, once it's established can tolerate fire fairly well. It doesn't illuminate um, on a good productive site. That's getting adequate rainfall. That's not terribly sandy. Cause like I said, I've, I've been on some properties where, you know, it's hard to get some stuff to grow at all, but no, I, I typically want them, I want every acre touched uh, every other year. Uh, I can't think of many examples right off the top of my head where I don't. But then again, the, all the constraints that go into prescribed fire, we usually end up probably on a three-year average on most sites I'm working on because some acre didn't get it, you know, for one reason or another. Or like this year, this was, you know, we did almost all our burning in March this year, uh, which is fine. But, you know, I usually get some done in February, some done in March, so I can get to all of it. There are some properties I didn't get to that I'm going to have to burn later. Uh, but yeah, no, I, I want it all touched every other year. Yeah, I agree. I, I think you, otherwise you run the risk of, and, and you, I, I know you had an earlier podcast about the fire plots at Tall Timbers, you know, with those three-year mm-hmm. fire return intervals on a productive site, you run the risk of quickly becoming a sweet gum, water mm-hmm. oak, 
you know, thicket um, if you let it go three years, and which you can get it back with herbicide, but then you're adding more cost. Um, and so we're, when we're talking about optimally for quail, for most sites, you want each square inch of that touch with fire every other year. And in some sites, I've seen 18 months, mm -hmm. uh, and some are going to be 36 months. But generally, again, that two-year fire return interval is what we want optimally. And just to add on to the hardwood encroachment, yeah, some of it may, if you miss that one year and then somebody, I've had this happen, they missed a year because of something happened. Then the next year when it was like, all right, this is the third year we got to get this burned. Somebody quit and then a tractor broke down and we were short on manpower. Well, now we're at four years and I've got a property, the same property I mentioned earlier, North Mississippi. It was for sale for several years, I think on the market for four years and uh, didn't get touched. It got bought. The landowner wasn't terribly comfortable with fire. Went five years. It wasn't until six year. The sixth year, it got a burn on it, and it is it is it is now a chemical operation to restore that mm -hmm. landscape. Um, it's very, very, very hard. Certain oak species and wet sites to get a good fire to knock them back. It's not impossible, but once they get over my head, I'm usually looking for for a chemical rate. Yeah, interesting. So. Uh, sort of related to to all these things, we we've mentioned several times that you know basically as much fire on the ground as you can get, and I've I've heard you say, you know that February March time frame. What what about other times of the year? Are, is there reasons or concerns with burning, you know, later into the spring or into nesting even during the summer or in the fall? Yeah, I, I want to just go back a, for a second. You mentioned February and March. Really, from my perspective, most areas, I want to burn March, April. I want to avoid February because mm -hmm. that's, again, when we have a lot of our halts coming through, in the early part of March. And if you burn, say, early February, that's probably, depending on where you're at, four, six, maybe eight weeks before you start getting really a lot of green up back. So those birds are having that lack of cover for that amount of time. Whereas if you're burning late March, it's going to green up really fast. So if, again, to, to give a broad prescription, I'm looking to burn March, April, even in the early May. And then to address your question about burning other times of year, I think you can burn even later in the May, early June, depending on, again, the context of what you're trying to accomplish with the vegetation, you know, People are concerned about burning up nests, but if you burn before May 15th, for example, you're only burning up potentially about 10% of your nests. And if you're a, a quail population on the brink of extinction locally, then that, you know that's something you might want to avoid. But most quail populations are robust enough to withstand a 10% nest loss because they're going to re-nest. Um, very prolific nester, so that 10% nest loss is not something I'm not concerned about, especially if you have a hard road issue that you're trying to control with that growing season fire. And then even if you wait all the way up into June 1st, you're still you're burning less than 25% of the nests that are incubated at that point. So again, if you need to clean up some hardwoods and you're doing it on a small scale on that 1,500-acre theoretical property we're talking about, you're you're not going to burn up that many nests in a 20 acre block uh, in that given year. And the long term gains from that are probably going to outweigh that. You know, you're going to mm -hmm. make up for that later in the nesting season. You're going to make up for yep. it next year because. And for a critter be that re nests quite re rapid, year. readily. Well, you know, not, not, yeah, yeah, not too much of an issue. You know, they're, they're going to re nest most um, likely. And like James said, that it's a long term benefits of that what that that acre is going to look like yeah. the next so it year. sounds like to me what you're saying is burning and less so we are obviously not out trying to burn up nests but uh if you do happen to burn up some nests that doesn't necessarily translate into decreased recruitment of quail right and it, it may actually translate into decreased recruitment of quail if you decide not to burn because it happens to be when they're nesting and then miss, you know, some acreage. And then maybe that happens two or three times and all of a sudden you don't have a usable space for quail anymore. Then that translates into population level 
problems potentially. That's right. I guess yeah. To, to sum up my uh, my general prescription here is it, ideally you would burn mid March to mid April, late April, something like that. If you can get all your burning done then, but if you can't, you're better off to get it burned in May than waiting the whole another year because most likely if it needed burning, they're not going to use it that year anyway. Uh, so don't prolong the inevitable or don't prolong the lack of habitat. Just burn it. Yeah, and that, that goes into why some of these properties I work on, we start some of them. We don't try to get it all done in February. We start a lot of in February in, in the agricultural landscape. It's because come March and April, they've got other things on their mind mm -hmm. in terms of row crop production that they're focusing on. So I lose a lot of manpower to, towards some of those goals. Uh, but no, I agree with James. You definitely want to minimize the window between blackout and mm -hmm. green up for, for lack of a better word. <clears throat> but if you look at, and Marcus, I think you're the general expert on this, is it something about later in the season, if like you have hardwood encroachment, like to James's point, if you want to burn in May, I, I'll get, use the property in North Mississippi as an example, went six years without burning, a great deal of really tall, you know, oaks coming up. And my recommendation was we need a, we need a, a later burn to try to, you know, put some stress on some of this, these hardwoods. And the landowner was like, I don't want to burn up nest told him the stats James just were, were just said, same thing. And I said, it's not really about, even if let's say those birds don't re-nest, they will not use this site at all mm -hmm. in the next few years. You, you risk sac maybe sacrificing a little bit of production, which technically you probably aren't uh, when you do the math versus it becoming unusable right. in the near future. And that, that's a, that's an easy equation to, to get wrapped around, but we do have a lot of landowners and it goes back to the things we we're talking about before the podcast started. We've been telling them things for years and now we're starting to tweak those things. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's a lot of change and a lot of new prescriptions. I, don't, I say new, we've probably, people have been saying you could burn that long for a while. I mean, I know mm -hmm. God, tall timbers. I've, you know, I've seen them burn in April for a year. That's not a, it's not a novel thing. Uh, but there is more flexibility, I think, is the message we need to get out there. And sometimes back to the process versus the, you know, we're trying to achieve an objective and that objective requires some flexibility in, in the timing of that prescription. Uh, but Marcus, what is it? What is it the time of year when the the oaks and their carbohydrates, when a fire were really uh, hardwoods, when a, when a fire, were, is it May or June? I can't remember. Well, it, I'd say June. starting in June in most of the South, okay. but that, that was one thing I wanted to take. Both of you kind of stopped there. And I know I, in the quail world, I've had a boot thrown at me a couple of times when I started mentioning burning out in, in the late season. But, you know, if we're, you know, going back to what you said earlier, Mark, you said something about you only had three days during your traditional burn window to burn. Well, what if you don't get what if you had a birthday party on one of them and a funeral on the other one, and then you didn't even get to use those? I mean, and then you're not going to get to burn any of your landscape. I mean, that could be a big problem in the grand scheme of things. And uh, based on some work from from uh, some of our colleagues, uh, a couple of them at Tall Timbers, the most underutilized part of the burn window in the, the southeastern landscape is the fall. We get a lot of good burn days and use very few of them. So I was curious what your thoughts are on that, because to just to add one thing before you all get into that, some of the research that's going on related to that uh, suggests there are some strong benefits compositionally from burning at that time where you have much higher mortality of these encroaching hardwoods. And some of my research shows that they'll be stunted, even the ones that survive in succession for maybe a year or two longer decreasing the need for fire to return again as frequently. So I'm just curious, I know in the, the, you know, there are some thoughts about this in the coil world that I'm not necessarily in tune with. I'm just curious what y'all's thoughts were on burning at that time. Yeah. First I'll say that a really hardcore coil manager, if they only have three burn days and they have a birthday party and a funeral, they're going to skip those and burn anyway. Uh, <laughs> they don't care if there's their kid's first birthday and then their, their brother's funeral, they're, they're going to go burn. And that's why most of them are, uh, you know, having as much as two to three birth per acre. Um, and cause they know how important it is, but fall burning is tricky. And I would say five years ago, I never would have thought much about it because you, 
most places I work on and people I know, they can get it done in the spring and they have success with it. But two two ways or reasons why I would consider fall burning, and one I've just really become privy to, and that's if you're trying to knock back cool season grasses like fescue. And again, if it's fescue, their quail are probably not going to use it all that much anyway. So if you burn it in the fall to set it back, you haven't really lost anything because you're going to gain what little bit you lost. You're going to gain that and some the following year. And, and fall is a good time to set that back. And then if I have small patches that have hardwood encroachment, to your point earlier, Marcus, fall burning would accomplish some of that as well to help set, set back hardwoods. However, I, I don't see it as being a large-scale tool because, again, we, we want these birds to survive the winter, and if we remove too much cover, they're not going to survive the winter. Um, and so we, we need at least fi about 50% of the population making it from October to the following April because we need around 20 to 25 percent annual survival so those six winter months we need 50 percent of them to, to be around come breeding season so if we're burning much more than a few acres in the say November or fall if we want to call October the start of fall that area is not going to grow back not going to provide cover that whole survival period that I've just mentioning and they're just not going to be able to use it and when they do they're going to get picked off by hawks so i just don't see it being a large scale tool but it's part of that using the scalpel approach if you have small areas that need to be burned for hardwoods i could see it being used in that way yeah and there's a there's kind of a in the winter time when in the fall when you know they're going to start using a little more shrubby cover woody cover kind of thing for a bunch of different reasons it's it's a fine line between something that a bob white or a covey might forage in or utilize for cover during the winter versus something that's completely unusable uh because it's too thick uh and that stains and I, I don't i don't know the best way to articulate where that line is but yeah there's never i don't think there's any reason we can't have more tools in the bag and a fall burning i think could, has a role to be played and i'm very curious to see some of the literature come out you know evaluating it but yeah it, a lot of it comes down to that overwinter period you know october to early you know to, to the next breeding season you know that's where we get a lot of mortality winter bottlenecks and you know reducing cover because it'll just be black all winter does create some some challenges but then again it's going to be scale dependent it's going to be but unlike the nesting or brood rearing where the hardwoods encroaching some of these more woody areas i've got a covey right now in west point it still hadn't broken up <clears throat> and they are they are still spending uh part of the day in some of that woodier stuff and then breaking out and 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 i wish they'd get out because you know it's, they need to get <laughs> they need to move out of there but the like i said that that's the i guess the challenge compared to the other scenarios we gave earlier was they might be using some of that during that winter period that they're probably not going to use as much of during uh, the other seasons, but I'm all for, like I said, I'm very much looking forward to see whether literature comes out on this and I'm not opposed to trying it on a few properties, but then again, it's one of those things where Marks, I think you're experiencing this getting landowners to try something that new, you know, you being the first guy really pushing that right now down there, you're going to get more than a boot thrown at <laughs> you, but somebody's got to, and I'd rather it be you yeah. than me. <laughs> well, I'm happy to, to take the boot. Uh, yeah, it's just a, a an interesting thing, you know. When I look at the the landscape, and we're talking about a bird that it, you've just said you want every inch to be touched by fire, you know, every other year. And then I look at the landscape and how much of the landscape that actually is happening in, and it's not that much of it, you know. Maybe a few plantation owners here and there, but. By and large, the majority of the landscape, and then I start thinking about restrictions on the burn window, and that's that's why I was asking you about it to see, you know, and I, I think you're right, Mark. They, these are all scale dependent issues. You know, you don't want to burn a thousand acres during nesting, or I mean, any time, but uh, you know, it, you certainly don't want to do that during a sensitive time. And it sounds like if you have a couple of extra small box or one that's particularly problematic that would be a good one to to uh 
you know, kind of put at the back of the line so it ends up with the fall burn or the, you know, the, the sensitive time burn. The other thing is if it's, if it's not usable for nesting, then why worry about burning it during nesting, right? So there, there's that to think about uh, as well. So, yeah, that really cool. I'm glad you guys are, uh, you know, letting us understand some of this stuff, it's a little more controversial. Yeah, I guess add one more thing about the fall burning as well is if the place is hunted frequently, you know, they're, they're not going to want to hunt through burn blocks, you know, f- fresh yeah. burns. You know, it wouldn't be enjoyable watching a bird dog run across <laughs> their dirt, not pointing any quail. Uh, so that's why another reason why it's not going to have broad scale adoption on a, an intensive quail managed property. But again, if it's not a hunted property and you've got these hardwood issues, I don't, I don't see any reason why not to, tr- to do a little bit of it for sure. And, and as I mentioned before, the fescue problem in the Midwest might be uh-huh. something that I would use a fall burn on. Well, what, let me ask you, and uh, I know we're, we're uh, starting to infringe on your guys' time, and I, I appreciate y'all taking some time, but I wanted to, to kind of go into one thing before we conclude based on this this whole context and the, the landscape context for quail right now and the fact that most places aren't quail plantations and we do have limited burn days and we're not getting enough burning done on the landscape scale do you th- do you still sort of stand by that same idea that you had earlier that if you you know if you're consistently don't have enough burn days and you could consistently double or triple those burn days by adding stuff would that be better for quail than uh not burning at all well i'll revisit one part of that we could always use more burn days and i assume by burn days we're saying days you're gonna that are conducive and you're gonna get a permit yeah i'm talking about when you can pull a permit and get fire to go (laughs) safely okay because you, you, you can get fired to go sometimes. Yeah. Not well, you, we're, uh, we're, we're still staying, sticking with the safe. <laughs> sticking with the safe. Remember, remember the bumper sticker. It says yeah. safe. And first. then a bunch yeah. of small yeah. things. Yeah. So I think there's two real things that I don't want to get too far off your question here. There's the amount of burn days. And then there's, in my case, and James, you may experience this too, because you're working in a bunch of different states there's burn days that landowners are comfortable burning in, which goes to our, all mm-hmm. of our topics here. They're used, they're, they feel more comfortable burning when the weather's a certain way than, and they feel a little bit less comfortable burning as we get further into the, the growing season, erroneous as it may be. So I've got enough burn days as it is, although I'm always looking for more. My constraints are landowners comfortability with mm-hmm. burn, the burn window uh, more so than my ability to get fire on the ground. Uh, but yeah, no, I mean, anything that increases burn days, like I said, the more we talk, I'm thinking of a spot right now, I might go light a fire this, this fall, just see what happens. <laughs> <laughs> but it's a small, just see what happens and, and any excuse to go light a fire, um, uh, safely. Uh, but yeah, so no, I, I think there, there are, I know the b- permits are getting harder to get sometimes. And I hear a lot of that, especially in different parts of the world. Um, but I also think that there's a large block of time that a lot of people just don't realize they still can burn and they've never tried to get a permit in May. Uh, private landowners. Yeah. Yeah. That's good points. Yeah. I agree with all that. I'm thinking back to when I was doing my dissertation on fire and quail and I did all the burning for my dissertation work. I was the burn boss and I averaged 30 burn days a year that I put fire on the ground and about 20 of those days happened in what I call optimal March april time period and then i i do remember some august burns which functionally is basically a fall Mm. burn from a plant perspective um and and those are burning areas that were i was in central florida that were overgrown with palmetto um and you know and then i burned some in february to create some safe areas so that when i burned at riskier times i wouldn't have to worry about it crossing in the, the neighbor's property so i was setting up my future burns so, yeah, I mean, it's don't want to be so rigid in that, okay, if, if you don't get it burned by April 15th, I'm going to wait the next year. No, burn it May 1st, burn it, burn it May 10th. And if you don't get it done then and it still looks bad and you don't think quail are going to use it over the winter time, burn it October 1st or September 15th or whatever. 
Uh, just don't do so much of it that time. Yeah, of you're year. not targeting um, then, but it's better to go on and get it, especially right. if it's not usable already. It's better to go ahead and get it in. Right, right. But if you're specifically burning for quail, and this is what, what sets most of the quail plantation manager apart is i wasn't really joking earlier about missing your kid's birthday uh they're going to make a priority to get it done during that optimal quail window i mean it's their life um and you know it's that in turkey hunting yeah. this time of year uh so that's what makes them good at their job and, and if people are interested in quail they have to have that same level of commitment Otherwise, we're just not going to have them. You know, I, I think you're right, James. And and I'm remembering back to my ninth birthday, which was my first, my favorite birthday of all time. And I woke up, <laughs> turkeys were gobbling, went hunting, and then we went and lit fire for my birthday party. Uh, it's all <laughs> there. He goes. There's no yeah. need to miss a birthday. You can bring yeah, the birthday exactly. to the fire. <laughs> we're lighting fire on top of a cake. Why don't you just have the cake with your fire out? It'd be more challenging to have a funeral associated with a Not, fire, but yeah, I, I guess, guess uh, maybe a off. cremation or something. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm just thinking because, as James knows, my son is a pyromaniac, and uh, yeah, and I'm just thinking for his next birthday, mm -hmm. assuming this pandemic gets under control, that we, we may just invite everybody out to one of these places we do, and this, you know, show the put the, put a drip hey, torch in these kids. Then you got an and, you've got yeah, an extension yeah, learning event and your kid's birthday party. I mean, that that's a win win. And, yeah. and some quail habitat. When I burn my when I burn my yard, he's he's right there with the flap, and he, yeah. he takes care of it all. You know, I just yeah. turn there it you loose. Go. You know. <laughs> well, guys, I I really appreciate you coming on the show and talking about this stuff. It's been a lot of fun, and uh, I I really wanted to to get you on to talk about quail because it is a little bit different. Uh, that the quail world's a little bit different than uh, some of the other the other sub disciplines of fire, I guess. Yeah. yeah, we're the better well, subdiscipline. Everybody, everybody thinks that they are. So <laughs> I'm just, I'm just trying to be a That's generalist right. here, right? You know? Not going to pick favorites. <laughs> but uh, yeah, again, I, I really appreciate y'all taking some time. I think this has been a great conversation, and I've, I've learned a lot. And I hope everybody out there's learned as well. If, if they want to find you or, or get more information or get in touch with you, how can they do that? Uh, email is probably the best. Uh, jmart22 at uga.edu yeah my email is probably the easiest way but i'd rather him call james yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> all right well guys i really appreciate it and uh thanks everybody for tuning in to fire university and uh, we'll catch you next time Fire University is part of the Natural Resource University podcast network funded by the Renewable Resources Extension Act. If you like what you heard today in this episode, please follow us on all the social media platforms at UF Deer Lab.